Hello, hello, this video is for all the global warming deniers that I have been engaging in conversations lately. And I, there are important thoughts that are coming up during these conversations and important insights and I think it is very critical to take a closer look at what is really going on inside of the black box called brain. And I want to make this very clear that neither my comments nor my videos are intended to put anybody down or to be somehow offstandish or arrogant or grandiose or whatever, you know, uh, whatever they think of me. Yeah. So that is not the case. I'm making these videos to bring awareness to this subject, to all of these subjects, and particularly the core subject where all the other subjects grow out of it in, in a circular, like a, like a hedgehog like a, <laughs> yeah, all of these problems arise from this core problem. And that's what I would like to talk about right now. And what I see is an incredible amount of unempowerment and shame. And the shame causes unempowerment and peer pressure, of course, and fear of being ridiculed, fear of losing friends, fear. I see it in all of these hundreds and hundreds of comments and people. For me, this is very interesting work, what I'm doing, because I see exactly straight into people's mindsets and brain and thought patterns and the causalities also. I see exactly the, the way they reason and why they reason like this and why they react the way they react and so on. So it all leads back to the same thing and it's, it is important for me to point this out in form of examples because just talking about it in an in just an in, in general terminology and just explaining it, this is how it is, it's that, that is not understandable enough. I have to put this into very concrete examples. And the more examples I can come up with and the more understandable the examples are, the better. Because this is very important to look at this from all angles, from the bird view, from the frog view, from the sides, from underneath, from all the way around, look at this core issue. And most of us don't do this, most of us don't even look at from any other angle other than the perspective that they are immersed in and have been immersed in their whole lives. So that's why it is so critical to step aside and look at the situation from a different angle and you will see a completely different perspective and you will see that that it is not as black and white cookie cutter as you thought it was. So it is a whole lot more complex. Um, most people are not bad or or good there, there are shades in between and there is reasoning why some people are like this they have their stories every brain is different every brain is trying to cope with things in a little different way instead of being judgmental and judging over people and putting them in files we need to understand where they're coming from. And I want to explain where I am coming from. So, and um, I have already explained that to some people, but they are still in extreme resistance. So that's why I try to explain it in more detail with the videos now. 
I'm going to start with me, where I'm coming from. I have been educated in a family that has always been non-religious, at least when I was born my parents had already left that Lutheran community, the church, they were during their study time they were only members because they paid into it. They were not already not believers but they wanted to support it because they still had the rudimental thought of maybe this will contribute something to some good so they paid some dues or something but then before right before i was born somewhere in 1964 1963 they had already left that church and they were <coughs> agnostic atheist agnostics so my brother and I were, we were born into a family of atheist agnostics and the subject religion <coughs> barely came up, it, it hardly ever came up. And if it came up, then in the context of like talking about someone else who is that way and s seems very stubborn in his perspective on on looking at the whole picture. So <coughs> I had the privilege, great privilege of growing up in a very intellectual household. Most people do not have that privilege and most people are drilled and they experience their parents' fears and just like a dog will become fearful of whatever his best friend, his caregiver, is afraid of. You know, uh, Cesar Milan talks about this in Debts. Uh, it's the same situation with children. Children are just like dogs. They will, and dogs are just like children, you know, declaration on consciousness. I, I want to make this very clear. This, um, this has finally been like publicly announced, which nobody in our circles needed, but obviously the, the globe of humanity needs to hear this, because these are facts, okay? M the mammals are all have the same nervous system, they have the same functions, the same basic functions the neocortex varies in size and the abstract thinking ability but that doesn't count for preciousness or non-preciousness you know, as much as you would regard your retarded baby as Sarah Palin has one because she doesn't use birth control and she just throws litter until no more litter comes, right? So, and then the retarded child is there and then she treats that retarded child just with just as much respect as her other children if she treats them with respect, which I hope she does. And I hope she treats all her beings in her life with respect. People are just as protective of their retarded children and find them just as precious as their other children, the, the ones with normal thinking capabilities. So that says something right here. That means that people should also treat their dogs equally to the other children because the dogs are just uh, on the cognitive level, maybe more like that retarded child, maybe a little m better off, or maybe not, or somewhat in between, or any kind of shade of different type of cognitive function can come out. In dogs, there's a specific range, and in people, there's a range that overlaps that, but it can also go fall into the same range as in the dogs, like in retarded children, for example. And then people think that the retarded child is more precious. 
Think again. Okay. The dog is equally precious. Uh, there's no difference. Okay. An elephant probably has a higher cognitive function than people. I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert on this. But from what I have seen, the videos I have seen on the internet, it really suggests that the elephant, even elephant ch children, you know, when they are just like a year old or so, they already get it. They already understand an awful lot. They understand more than, than people give them credit for. And um, I talked about this in another video about this tragic case of the elephant baby in, in South Africa. I'm not going to get into it right now. So what I want to point out is people, when they grow up in working class families, where there are completely different perspectives on life and different outlooks and and different fears and and the horizon of options seems to not be as wide at all as the horizon of options of somebody who can see things from all angles or from more angles than the person in the, in the working class situation. And that's very unfortunate. I heard a lot of people say to me on the internet, why are you struggling to help them, let them be stupid and clean our toilets, with other words. You know. So, but that's a very convenient capitalist and 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 a very very uncompassionate way of looking at it ultimately that probably will happen but i as as somebody who cares i'm not going to be standing there and saying yeah great you know they asked for it uh, i don't do that because i want to help them i want to help people empower themselves and not roll the re red carpet out to those very people who enslave them in the first place. And that's what they're doing all the time. They are corporate slaves and they don't realize that they have more options, actually, that there's the option of education, you know, and of empowering themselves and of widening their their possibilities and and uh, to make life better for themselves and enjoy life more and not live life like um, watching soap operas at night drinking beer going to sleep not having very good sleep and being woken up with the loud alarm clock way too early in the morning, then going to a lousy job like that UPS guy and suffering and not questioning any th any of this, not even one time, you know. And that's what I mean. People look at it, you know, look at this. Look at the religion that y that has been drilled into your brain. Look at it, question it. You know, is this really what life is supposed to be, you know, like work you know, or drill or drill in your brain and drill into planet earth this is so in insanely adverse to life to your life to all life so i i, d I don't know how i can possibly get this get this into people's heads, how I can possibly get them to understand that life is not there to just work and, and be fearful of brimstone and, and fire and, and God or gods that are bloodthirsty and Christian God slapping them like daddy did or or Lakshmi sucking the blood out of you. Um, you know, 
or Hare Krishna, matter of fact. Krishna was supposed to be good God, but then it was Hare Krishna movement turned it into a, again into a guru situation, into a suppression, into a dictation. So it's unfortunate that this always has to happen again and again and again. It doesn't matter what the original message was, you know. So that's why Friedrich Nietzsche, he refused to be seen as a guru. He, and, and, and neither did Rudolf Steiner. Rudolf Steiner got mad at people when they, when they worshipped him. He said, I don't want to be worshipped, I want to be understood. Okay? And his message was to empower people and to make things happen and to make planet Earth into a paradise. Okay? and not fall back into another, yet another, yet another religion, and yet another, it's like you take the crutches away from somebody and he'll fall right into the arms of, an, of another person who gives him another set of crutches with a different color on it, you know. It's kind of like, this is, it's always the same thing, you know. People fall from one crutch to the next because they seem to not be able to exist without the mental crutches, without the scam, as Jesse Ventura said. You know, people have to have crutch and scam to, they can't, can't walk on their own. And that's the problem here. And, and out of this arises so much hardship, so much suffering, that is so incredibly unnecessary. And most families, even most intellectual families too, have shamed their children. You know. They have done it either deliberately or they have done it subconsciously. Because most humans, and, and that's what Arjanov said, most humans are neurotic. Most people have experienced suppression as children. Most children, or all children, they explore when they're children. They, they still ha see things from all angles. They still are connected. They still see this infinite amount of possibilities in play and art. And even if it's just an imagination, you know, and if they see certain things around them, if they see a fairy, and if they see something that they interact with, if they see dimensions other than the adults see, what happens is the adults, when they see the child be playful and artistic and have a good time, the adults shut them up, usually. They shame them. They tell them all kinds of things. They tell boys not to cry. They tell uh, boys not to play with dolls or to be, they, te they warn them they, that that comes across as girly. Or they tell the girls that they are, um, that they are crazy or something like this, and so they shame their children consciously or subconsciously shame them and the children begin to shut up. But they shut them up at a very early age, usually. And then the children become mechanistic and they become ad ad adapted. And in Japan, this is very, very, very extreme, what I'm talking about. It's, in Japan, it is brought to an absolute extreme. And it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. In Asia, in general, but in Japan, it is so extreme. This shaming and this, this mechanistic lifestyle and this coldness and this shutting off of the the inner creativity, you know, the the play child, the 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 the, the, the true existence, why they why they are here in the first place, 
they're here to to learn and to experience and to connect you know with other life but in Japan it is exactly the opposite it's m they make people shut that part of themselves completely off and in in the whole world this is happening you know in various degrees and I, I had the fortune that my dad is an architect and he is very, very artistic. He is an artist as well. He does drawings and he's very creative and he lives in a, in a beautiful world inside of his mind and he still kept part of his inner child alive. And um, my grandmother, she made sure of that, that, that at least part of their son's inner child stays alive, while my grandfather, of course, tried to chip away at it, because he, in turn, had been chipped away uh, at it from his own parents uh, in a very brutal way as well. And so it just goes back into far and far and far distant ancestor families this type of behavior and and it just get, keeps getting traded to the next generation and so on until until we consciously stop it and say no no more okay i'm not going to do this anymore i'm i'm not going to even have children to create the same mechanism again because I don't know if I am psychologically ready for it. So it, it's, it's a long healing process that has to happen. But at least I see that there is a trend that at least what I see in the in the Western world there is a trend of families getting a little bit better in with each generation. So the terrible faults of the parents will not be as terribly traded to the next generation as before, but they are always the rest of this neuro neurotic behavior. But that's, that is why it is so critically important that we have people who speak out, that we have Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and Lou Andrea Salome and people like this who are the forerunners for a paradigm shift in society because with, without those people this shift would probably not happen. It, without this influence from, from outside people who are reminding us, look, look at, look within. Yeah. Jiddu Krishnamurti ve is a very influential person. Look within yourself and, and then you go, ah, yeah, this is what I've been doing. I, I need to stop right now. And the more we do this, the more the lamp comes on and we say, yeah, this is what I've been doing again. I need to stop this the the better will be the outcome for the next generations for the for the teaching of the next generation in general you know whether they are our own kids or our nieces and nephews or the kids that we meet on the street or the kids that we teach in schools and so on you know. so we will have a better way of teaching them if we introspect and if we learn from those forerunners this is extremely important extremely important there are some extremely important masterminds that have existed throughout history and they are they are the teachers of humanity and the buddha i would say is the number one philosopher you know, who has really contributed and I don't know what it would be like w if that had not that message had not been spread then 
it would be e even worse. So at least now, even though after thousands of years, as always, people made it into a religion and then it became rigid and then kids were spanked and all of these terrible things, even in Buddhism, the Dalai Lama was whipped because he wasn't doing his homework. It's all wrong. Okay. But at least in Buddhism, <coughs> they don't teach, they have never taught something like to create torture instruments, to torture witches. They have never told people to chop someone's head off. They have never administered anything like this as like the way of life, you know, like torture and punishment and all of this. And so that's because the, the original teaching of the Buddha has prevailed at least to a certain degree to like this foundation of the teachings, like be peaceful, you know, even though they contradict themselves and a lot of times because they will misunderstand it or they will misconstruct it and use it in, in, in a different way or something like that, you know, because they didn't really, really understand the core of it. Most people, most of them, but at least the basics is there, you know. This is already like a thousand notches higher than those a Abrahamic religions. So no doubt about it, and there's a lot of Hindu religions that are way better as well. And the Buddhism has arisen from the hin Hindu traditions. I mean, the Buddha has been brought up in the Hindu s traditions and in that environment. But then there's also Hindu religions that are extremely adverse, just like the Abrahamic religions, so like Lakshmi, for example, you know, the bl bloodthirsty goddess, and and uh, they even do child and animal sacrifices. So this is an atrocity, okay. and uh, and in particular, the animal sacrifices in India, that has to be stopped. This is. This is an utmost horror. It's a holocaust. It is, it's, it's the dark ages that are still happening today. And everyone on planet Earth must stand up for the animals and say no to animal and child sacrifices. This is, this is the worst there is. This is the worst I have ever seen. And I cannot, I mean, I've only seen a few glimpses of it. I, I just can't. I can't handle it at all. But whoever can handle it, I advise people to look at it because the footage is there, you know, the evidence is there. And there are people and groups who are starting to stand up against it, but we need way more people to help and to sign the petitions to stop the sacrifices. And right now, the, these sacrifices are going on in India right now. They have this every year, I think around this time. And it needs to be stopped. Okay. People need to speak out to legislation, to their own legislators, to the legislators that are representing that particular tradition <coughs> and the ambassadors and so on. We need to speak out to these people. We need to put pressure on them. It is very critical in order to be connected and compassionate, be compassionate, joyful, living beings. We have to make the journey within ourselves and we need to become our own observers and we need to understand that we need to dissolve that shame that is in us and the fear of other people's influences on us and of their ridicule and what they think and their judgment and all of this. So we need to dissolve that. It doesn't matter what someone else thinks of you. It really doesn't matter. What matters is that you are on the path towards love, 
compassion and loving kindness. That's the only thing that matters. So please make the journey within yourselves. Thank you. Take care.